Honor not just to, to welcome one guest, but two guests today uh, in Maggie oh. Feldman Pitch and nice General West Clark. Um, of course, many of you know your colleague uh, Maggie, who will be graduating, I think. That's the plan. Um, uh, in a few weeks, depending on if she gets her thesis done. Um, but we very much look forward to that. She, of course, is the, the founder, CEO of NatSec Girls Squad, which, is, as far as I understand, about basically bringing greater female representation into the, the national security establishment, and particularly the military and defense, where where that's sometimes been lacking, um, and it's just done a great job. We're very proud of you, Maggie. Thank, Thank you. you. And she is also a junior <laughs> junior centennial fellow, is in the title, um, paired up with our distinguished guest, which is uh, General Wes Clark. Um, General, I won't, you, you, you saw his bio, and that's why you're here. Um, uh, a couple of things I would point out. You were class of 1966 at West Point, valedictorian at West Point uh, in 1966. What an interesting uh, time to come out of there. Um, uh, and of course, he, he was commander uh, of uh, U.S. forces, NATO forces in the Kosovo War, uh, supreme commander of allied forces from uh, in the late 90s. Um, and then his career took a turn uh, uh, when he uh, decided to run for president of the United States in the 2004, um, uh, for the 2004 campaign. Um, again, would love to hear, hear some thoughts about that experience. Um, and then, of course, is here at Georgetown, I'm skipping ahead a little bit to just the major points, uh, to be a centennial fellow here at Georgetown University. Um, we welcome you. I'm going to let Maggie run the show, uh, uh, and you as well. Um, encourage lots of discussion back and forth. I mean, here's your chance to learn from someone who, who basically has, has had so many different amazing experiences at the highest level and wants to talk to you about it, wants to communicate what lessons he's learned and insights. And so we're very grateful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maggie. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead, grow me. Oh, Take thanks. It All right, so it obviously needs no introduction, just a few parameters. Anything you don't want to answer, just say you don't want to answer it. Um, I have some questions, but rather than do all my questions first and then turn it over to you all, if there's something you really want to ask as this conversation is going, just stick your hand up. And I'm assuming since we are recording this, just be aware that we're recording it. Um, and perhaps if you could give your name, um, whether you're a student and if you're working, all of those things. Um, please ask a question. Don't make a statement. I will cut you off. Um, there are a few things I know we, I want to talk to you about. One of them is Venezuela, but we'll get there. Um, I'm particularly interested in your decision to run for president. And this is something you and I have talked a lot about over the last year, um, that not everybody was crazy about that idea. And you have a very particular understanding and vision of civ mill relations. Somebody probably heard. Town. This is my wife calling because oh, she heard you, you mention the president. <laughs> and she doesn't want me to you run can't for be president. president. Just a second. Honey, I'm not running for president, okay? But I'm in, <laughs> I'm in front of this plan. I'll call you back. Love you. Bye. That's real partnership. Um, so we, I think Georgetown students, particularly in this program, some have served in the military, some are active duty, and, and they're here. Um, some are, are military adjacent. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation over the last three years about what happens if and when military officers enter the political realm. Um, and that wasn't the case in 2004. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about your decision to run and how the landscape has changed, particularly for a retired four-star in the last, what year, 15 years. Okay, now I'm going to try not to ramble on. All right, I'll just cut you off. It's a time. big question. It's like, you know, why did you go to Georgetown and what did you learn at university, right? I mean, you could talk for hours on that. And it's also very flattering when people ask you about yourself. So um, I'm going to just sort of lay this out. So I uh, really didn't have any intention to be in politics ever in my life. I never thought about it. I'd been in the Ford administration as a White House fellow. I was an Army uh, major, just made promotion of major, and um, I got as close to the White House as they would let me, which was the Office of Management and Budget. And then uh, I got to go over and work on a special project for Don Rumsfeld and uh, Dick Cheney when we were investigating the, we, the Congress, was investigating the, the, the intelligence community in 1975. So I had six or eight weeks in the White House, and then I had the rest of the time in the Office of Management and Budget, I had an office right across from the director in that beautiful old uh, 
1865 building. So I consider myself a Republican, but I was never a member of a party. It's just that if you were an army officer, Democrats were like, they were like, like fleas and lice, and it's like, ugh, like they're, they're always trying to take money from you. They're accusing you of things. They're, they were just, they, they just weren't constructive. And what we were trying to do is rebuild the army after the Vietnam War. So I came back from Vietnam, and I taught at West Point, and I did various assignments, and I rose through the ranks by accomplishment in, in the positions I was given. And, um, and so I never had a political party. I knew when I worked in the White House with the Ford administration that it was kind of scary. I, was, I got there a year after uh, Nixon had resigned, and uh, when I went over to work for Rumsfeld and Cheney, and I was inside the White House, the deputy counsel called me aside, and I asked a couple of questions, and he said, uh-uh, you can't work here if you ask questions like that. I was like, whoop, 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 you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just an army guy. So, nope. Can't ask those kinds of questions. It was a clubby relationship. It was uh, like the criticism that you saw of uh, Justice Kavanaugh and being part of that club. That's kind of how it felt. Everybody would go out uh, in the afternoons uh, not, uh, on occasion with Roger Ailes, who had been part of the advance team with Nixon in 72, and Roger would take them to the class reunion bar which is no longer in existence, I guess, up on 16th Street, and everybody would drunk, get drunk. And, uh, you know, I, I never did that because I was married. I had a little boy at home, and my wife, um, she keeps close tabs on me. <laughs> She's like, you get home here. And, um, and so, uh, but, but I had, you know, I felt good about President Ford, and I knew that our heart was in the right place, and it wasn't destructive. But I ended up as a three-star working around the Clinton White House, and I found it was open, it was um, open to ideas, it wasn't clubby, people were engaged and engaging, and uh, I had a job in the Pentagon where I came over to state and, and the White House every day, sometimes more than once a day, to attend meetings on behalf of my boss, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I, and I respected them. But, you know, I'm a guy who learned the lessons from Vietnam. I say when you commit military forces, you go in to win. You don't waste our men's and women's lives or the country's treasure on stupid operations. Vietnam turned out, as we did the, you know, discovery on Vietnam 30 and 40 and 50 years later, of course, it was a waste. And it was President Johnson who went into it with no winning strategy. But, I didn't know all that, obviously, when I was a captain as an infantry company commander in Vietnam. So when I was an NATO commander and we were getting involved in Kosovo and when I set up the plans, I had no doubt. You put the U.S. credibility on the line in a military operation, you're going to win. People would say, well, are you going to win against Serbia? Yeah, a little tiny Serbia, yeah, 10 million people. Yeah, you're going to win against Serbia unless NATO falls apart. So um, I was always more hard line than the Democrats that I was around. They were always a little squishy, like, oh, well, can you, um, can, but, but they were happy to come to the military and say, give us your budget. Well, we can't do the job with the bombs. You military people go clean up Haiti, you know? And so I was the one when we did the invasion of Haiti that said, you know, <laughs> says not military. Once you get in there, what are you going to do? Who's going to provide the police? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? What's the exit strategy? So I went with Madeleine Albright up and we negotiated an exit strategy with Boutrous Boutrous Scali in 94. But <clears throat> so I was, I was neither fish nor fowl. I wasn't a good Republican because I asked too many questions. And I wasn't a good Democrat because I was too hard and I was too, you know, forceful so on things. so much in common. <laughs> I mean, it's just who I am. So I got out of the military. I was going to be an investment banker, wrote a book. I had the CNN contract, and first nothing happened. And then 9-11 happened. I was on three or four times a day. And then people, you know, began to then look at what I did in Kosovo. And I had a lot of backing. and. Uh, and when John Kerry had prostate cancer and sort of dropped out, then I got pressure from the Clintons and people associated with the mainstream of the Democratic Party that had worked with me to run for office. 
And they told me, I mean, it was very clear, you know, we can't let Howard Dean take over this party. He's the radical left. And actually, Howard is a, is a pretty good guy, and he's not a radical left guy. But to the Clintons and the people around him, he was, a, he was frightening. And, and maybe it had to do with the fact that there was always the idea that Hillary needed her turn to run, and, and Dean might take that away from her if he came in. Anyway, I got a lot of backing. Charlie Rangel called me, President Carter, former National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, Madeline called me, and, uh, and then there was a draft movement that started. And of course it's a very flattering thing to think you could be President of the United States. I mean, he's the Commander-in-Chief, and I thought, and I was going to be a nuclear physicist, and, and, and I wanted to be an astronaut. I was interested in outer space and the stars and, you know, what you could do with mankind. I always, I started reading Plato when I was 14, and I mean, I just, you know, I had, I, I wasn't like your average, what, what you might think a military guy is, like, oh, show me that book on guns and ammo. Yeah, I really like this, uh, this, uh, you know, a Glock. This Glock is better than an S&S, and, &S. and uh, you know, uh, look at this, uh, how much better, you know. I, I, I did that. I've got my uncle's 45 and the German Luger at home, but I wasn't like a gun aficionado. I was sort of big picture because that's the way we were brought up in the 50s. Is it was about being a soldier statesman and George Marshall and Eisenhower as the president. And so it was intriguing to think about running. And so um, I had to finish my second book and um, then people said, well, you've got to get serious about this. I mean, <laughs> there's already nine Democrats in the race. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know how to run. I mean, I've never run for office. You have to have, <coughs> you have, to have a, a plan, a strategy. <clears throat> this, is, this is Iowa. What, I mean, what, what about Iowa? I said, well, I've never been there. <laughs> he said, uh, well, well, who's going to be your campaign manager? I said, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know any campaign managers. But, the, but so how much are you going to pay? And I said, I don't have any money. He said, well, you got to get going. I said, but I, I, don't have a, I don't have any income. If I quit my job, then I, then, I, then I don't have any money at all. They said, don't worry, you can get paid by the campaign. I said, really? Oh, okay. So we ended up in, I ended up in New York. It was like just before Labor Day or just after Labor Day. And I interviewed very high, is this too much detail? No, this is good. You like the nitty gritty? I do. I mean, I could just cut this off in a second, but, but, so I interviewed a very high-ranking guy in the Democratic establishment who could have been a fund a chairman for me. He said, "How much money do you have?" I said, "Well, I don't have any money right now. I mean, I, you can't, you can't raise political funds unless you declare a party, and you have to form a legal organization to do this. And then I haven't formed anything. You need an exploratory committee." But if, if you're in Congress, that's easy. I mean, just tell your staffers. That's a call about Ukraine. Forget that. <laughs> and uh, and then you call your staffers, and they and they work things. But when you're in business, I mean, what are you going to do? So this guy just sort of shoved me out of his office. And um, but I had a paid speech in Iowa on the 19th of September, and I kept and I kept calling people. I called Vice President. I called Senator Biden. I testified before him a couple of times. And, I, I consulted heavily with a lot of different people, and, and, and I kept trying to find a good reason not to run. And, and Biden told me, <clears throat> he said, I think you ought to run. He said, you've got a 30% chance of winning the primary, and if you win the primary, you can beat George W. Bush. Well, I, I was waiting for him to say, you've got a 90% chance of winning the primary. <laughs> I didn't realize there was only a 30% chance. I said, but... I said, Joe, I think you ought to run. He said, well, I can't. He said, my wife doesn't want me to. I said, well, my wife doesn't want me to either. <laughs> and my wife heard me say, she got on the phone and said, Joe, you should run. So he didn't run, but he did help me. But, uh, and, I, and I, like, I like Vice President Biden a great deal. One of the decisive moments in deciding whether to run or not was I got a call from my old uh, buddy, Richard Holbrook. Holbrook and I have always had a difficult relationship because actually, in terms of the bureaucracy, when I was working with him, I was actually superior to Holbrook. Holbrook was the Assistant Secretary for European Affairs. I was like the Undersecretary. I was the J-5 Director 
for strategic plans and policy for the whole world, but because the civil rules the military in a democracy. When we went on the Dayton Peace Talks, I worked for Dick. So it was always a little bit of a jousting contest. But he always knew he could get me fired. All he had to do was tell somebody, Clark's no good, and he'd be fired. So he always felt like he had, he always had the upper hand in this. So he called me, and uh, he said, Wes, he said, you can't run. He said, John Kerry doesn't want you to run. And, um, and, and if you run, John Kerry won't pick you to be his vice presidential running mate. Well, my wife heard this, and she had lived through <coughs> my whole book years. She knew exactly what the ups and downs are in working with Dick. She know, ex knew exactly how he operated. And so that, once the phone call hung up, she, that made her really mad. <laughs> she said, well, in that case, I think you should run if Holbrook is telling you not to. So those were a couple of the incidents. And finally, it came down to the week I had to go to Iowa. And um, so it was a Monday morning, and I knew I had to make a decision. I kept putting it off. And uh, my wife went out for a walk, and she said, I'm coming back in an hour, and I want you to make a decision. So I sat down, and I've always gone to the prayer and uh, the spiritual side when I've been faced with you know, really tough decisions. So I opened up my Bible and um, I read the 55th Psalm. And uh, I always had thought when I was in Kosovo and I would read the Bible, I would always you know, get a nice feeling of, you know, I know I'm doing the right thing. So I opened up the 55th Psalm and I read it and I put my head down on the desk and I pray, nothing, nothing. I mean, total silence, not a tingle, not a twinge, nothing, not even a bird chirping outside. <laughs> So about 20 minutes of this, and I realized I'm not getting anywhere with this. Maybe I read the wrong psalm. So I go back and read the 56th psalm, put my head down again, pray again, and suddenly the phone rings. And there's a deep male voice on the other end of the line that said, Wes, you must run. I said, but, but who is this? He said, Wes, listen to me, you have to run. I said, but who is this? It sounded like the voice of God. You know. <laughs> It was, it was a Tom Johnson who had been the head of CNN. And, and Might as then, well be the voice of God. And, yeah. and then I put my head down again, and then I had AOL at the time. And you know how you get that little ting? It's like you've got mail. So I was, my head was on the computer. And so it was hard to avoid this. So I involuntarily looked at it, and it was from a guy who edits the Washington Monthly. And he said, don't do what Colin Powell did. He got ready to run in 1996 and he chickened out, or he, I shouldn't say that, that he decided he didn't have fire in his belly. And about that time, my wife got back from the walk. I was just raising my head from the computer and she said, okay, what's the decision? And I'm like, I think I'm gonna run. <laughs> it, was, it was like, I was made for this. No, 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 it was like, I think I'm gonna run. And so that was a decision, and we ran. And um, I loved it. It was five months of tremendous uh, put out, great learning experience, a lot of personal agony and pain involved in the sort of nonstop. But I met so many people, I got to 30 states in 90 days. We had a big online operation in those days. Big was like $3 million, so we raised $3 million online. I probably, people said I would have won the New York California and DC primaries, but they didn't count. The only thing that counted was Iowa, where I wasn't competing because the people that converged on me after I announced were the Hillary people, or the, the, the Clinton people. They were the ones who'd stayed out of the race because they worked for Gore. They came in to work for me, and they're like, well, don't mess around with Iowa. Bill didn't do Iowa. I mean, just, uh, you know, you can do, and I'm like, yes, but, but Iowa and New Hampshire, you know, in those days they were three weeks apart. Now they're back to back, and uh, what about the momentum? Don't worry about the momentum effect. We'll take care of that. You go out and concentrate on being a good candidate. We'll do everything else. So I called it the campaign of the four no's. No strategy, <laughs> no staff, no money, and no experience. I used to say, I've never even run for student council. I never run. <laughs> I mean, I always thought student council elections were like, I mean, come on, who wants to talk about paving another 20 yards of the parking lot? I mean, really. Uh, or, or the cafeteria needs a new Coke machine. Come on. 
So I was interested in physics and aliens and the stars and faster than light drives. So I didn't run for student council. And uh, so this was my real first real experience in politics. I loved it. People come to you and they tell you their life stories. My husband, he's such a great guy and he got lost his job and now and we can't make enough money and I can't move and we own the house and no one will buy the house and you've got to fix the, this thing and the unions and this and that. I mean, and all these stories and these people trusting you and they bleed and God, it's just the most amazing education. And you want to help. You really want to help. And I learned so much. I mean, I had the top bankers instructing me uh, from Wall Street on the economy. Now, okay, this was 2003. This is before 2008. <laughs> so, and, and then I had, you know, the top people in healthcare. They, they wrote me a healthcare plan. You know, it was like 12 pages of fine print with multiple bow legs, sub things, underlined stuff. And this is what we're going to do about a person with misaligned teeth and so forth. It's like, oh yeah, okay, sounds great, you know. And, um, and so it was a wonderful experience. I didn't win, but I did want oh, win you Oklahoma. You, you, and, you uh, didn't win. The strategy that they concocted was stay out of Iowa, finish third or fourth in New Hampshire. You're not going to be Dean and Kerry because they've done these New Hampshire campaigns. They've worked there for 20 years. They know everybody in the state who's involved politically. And then you're a Southerner. You should have a chance in South Carolina, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona. So what happened was that these campaigns were back, bang, 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 every one a week. And so they really overwhelmed the ability to run separate campaigns. It was just all about the momentum. So, you know, if you, can't, if you won coming out of New Hampshire, what happened is the, the first day the news would be, okay, uh, who won in New Hampshire? The second day would be, uh, oh, he won in New Hampshire again. The third day would be, why did he win in New Hampshire? And the fourth day would be, what does this mean for the rest of the campaign? And you get like by Friday, you might be preparing for the next uh, event, which was on Tuesday. So there wasn't any time to get out a new message or anything. You were just sort of branded as a sort of loser after the first one. And it was really hard to come back. So I did make it in Oklahoma because um, we had a good campaign organization there. And I was second in North Dakota, Arizona, and New Mexico because um, that was, those were the states that I was winning before the national momentum carried John Kerry. But the Democrats finally said, look, we don't, I mean, after three or four weeks, they said, let's just get together, agree on a candidate that could be George Bush. We got John Kerry, he's a veteran, he's a senator, he's reliable, we, we know him, stay with John Kerry. I mean, what are you going to do with Clark? I mean, Clark, the generals even have questions about Clark. I had, you know, all the usual sort of jealousy coming up and everything. And, um, and so, and, and, and you know, for Democratic voters, you're like, well, there's the military here that's a block, and of course, uh, I mean, if he's not the, if the military, you know, whatever. It's just, you couldn't communicate. I guess the key thing was, after the Iowa caucus votes, I was in campaigning in New Hampshire, and a guy from Boston Public Radio nailed me on a Thursday afternoon and he said, General, he said, I've got a question that our listeners in this area want, viewers want to know. He said, John Kerry was a war hero in Vietnam. How does your military record compare to John Kerry's? <laughs> so, if you get asked that question, the first thing you realize is, you're in deep, deep trouble. <laughs> because they don't know who you are. The second thing you have to do is not make a sneering, snide comment like, okay, well, we were both in Vietnam at the same time. A guy fell off his PT boat and John turned around and picked him up. And uh, if he hadn't, he'd have been court-martialed. And he got an award for that. Me, I led my company into a base camp. I was the first man shot. And I got an award for that. So I'd say we're pretty much equal on Vietnam, but I stayed with it for another 30 years and was a four-star and commanded an alliance and actually won a war for this country after the diplomacy. I'd say I have a pretty good military career compared to John Kerry. But if you'd said that, it would have been a horrible answer. So you, you had to say something like, not won. huh? You would have still not won. Oh, it wouldn't have made anything. It just made people like, oh, this is an old general. He doesn't, you know, he's, he's self-seeking and all that. You just have to say, you have to say, when some, someone asks you like that, you have to say, look, I, 
you know, and this is what I said basically, I admire John Kerry's war record. He did a great job over there. I also, you know, had a good record. I stayed with it for 30 years and I'm very proud of what I was able to do in the armed forces. And, and it's not a win, it's not a loss. They're just looking for a gotcha moment, you know, that's all. And, uh, but what it tells you is your campaign failed because the three things in politics you have to do is identify yourself or define yourself, define your opposition, and then quickly respond to any attacks. Those are, that's the basic key to winning in politics. And we hadn't defined myself. So thinking about your experience in, in 2004, and while we have some empty cabinet positions right now, um, there are, or there have been, more retired senior military leaders on the civilian side, I'm thinking particularly about Mattis and Kelly, then, I mean, I won't tell you how old I was in 2004, but my guess, my recollection of 2004 is that it wouldn't have flown, right, to have two retired four stars, um, and then a retired, or I guess an active duty three star, you know, as national security advisor. Right? The military has a different kind of role in the public persona now, maybe, than it did in 2004? No, no, I don't think that's correct. I mean, I think that, Maggie, what you're seeing is a sort of, you know, the, the sort of near-term focus as it goes up and down. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the long run of American history, the military has always been deeply involved in pon politics. I mean, but is that a good thing? I, that's what I'm trying to ask you, right? Oh, okay. So, so We've got it's a, an, it's a normative question rather yeah, than a descriptive yeah, question. Right. Okay. So well, when was the last time you know we we had a secretary? So obviously Mattis is no longer SecDef, but do you think it poses some challenges to have a retired senior leader, particularly a retired four star, in the SecDef position? Well, I don't think that. First of all, when people um, when when people go through the military, they all have different experiences. So nobody has the same experience. Sure. The Army and the Marines are closer than, let's say, the Navy and the Air Force. Sure. Army and Marine guys all start out as platoon leaders, company commanders, battalion commanders, and then, then it, they start to diverge. So you have to handle people. Uh, Air Force guys start out, if they're going to make it to the top, they're pilots. They don't have to do anything but pat the crew chief on the, on the back and say, good job, chief, and then it's about how they handle themselves you know, in, their, in, their, in their machine. And uh, there are, as they say, there are bold pilots and old pilots, but no bold, old pilots. So you have to portray the boldness without actually acting on the boldness. So uh, it's about, you know, your performance professionally. For the Navy, it's, you know, it's, it's three different clubs. It's surface, aviation, and undersea. And uh, you have different rules and norms. So they, everybody has different experience. When you get to be a general officer, you all have it. Everybody has a different experience depending on where you serve. The difference, it's like a exponential scale. If you go back and look at logarithms and exponents, you know that that when you go from from the 99th percentile to the 99.9th percentile on anything, it's a huge step. And to go from a two star to a three star is a big step and to go from a three star to a four star is a huge step and then depending on what four star job you have that's a huge thing I had head of state status in Europe so I had the blue light special treatment when I went to, to Italy I was met in Rome by the carabinieri and they forced people off the road and the blue lights were flashing when I went from my headquarters up to Brussels there was a blue light and we drove at 200 kilometers an hour and forced people off the road and I'm, they did this when I wasn't paying attention I, in the back seat. When I got them slowed down and they behaved themselves, it wasn't quite so obnoxious. But the point is that, you know, I, I had the right to see and I often saw and usually saw heads of state. Four stars who are head of their services, when they go abroad, they usually don't see the head of state. They usually see the Minister of Defense. I could call the Ministers of Defense. I didn't report to them. I reported to the NATO Secretary General. So it's an odd sort of thing. In the U.S. rank structure, I was below the service chiefs, but in terms of actual experiences, I was up there with, you know, I, I dealt with everybody. I didn't even represent the United States. So um, everybody has different experiences. So is it a good thing or a bad thing? Look, you don't want the armed forces to become, people in uniform, to become politicized. 
Right. I had a case um, when I was on the campaign, a guy who was out of the Marine Corps who said, I was a lieutenant of the Marine Corps and how could you be a Democrat? How could you? He said, we were all card-carrying Republicans. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> card-carrying Republicans as lieutenants in the Marine Corps? That, that's, that's really disgusting. So, um, you don't want that. Um, you want people who will be loyal to their chain of command and the President of the United States, regardless of which party he's in. And really, it's what MacArthur said to the graduating class at West Point in 1962. He said, it's not up to you to ask or answer the great policy questions of the day. Those are the responsibility of the nation's elected and appointed leaders. Your job is to fight and win America's wars. That's what MacArthur said, and that's true. Now, it's better than having to fight a war is to deter a war. And so I grew up in the deterrence army. But when people are out of the military, then why shouldn't they? They have the same rights as any other citizen. If you were a doctor, nobody would say, hey, you're a doctor, you can't possibly be in government. I mean, you might be looking at everybody in life thinking, hey, I'd like to cut that person open and see what their gizzard looks like. <laughs> so, or, you know, if you're a teacher, you can't, you can't possibly be in politics. You were a college professor, and uh, you'll be looking at everybody and say, would I give that person an A, or are they like an A minus quality person? No, you can't do that to people. This is all America, you're a citizen. So there's nothing wrong with, with using that expertise. Now what would be wrong is it's the person himself. If you're narrow, if you can't grow, if you can't see but beyond the confines, like when, when John Kelly, who used to work for me, became the White House Chief of Staff, he, 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 he was the Southern Command commander. That's a job I had back 23 years ago, responsible for Latin America, the drug interdiction, etc. He then became Secretary of Homeland Security. Okay, that's a reasonable step up and, you know, okay, he's at the political level, but he's basically running a huge complex organization. When he becomes White House Chief of Staff, he has four problems. He has a knowledge and competence problem because it involves health, education, the budget, uh, all kinds of stuff that military guys know nothing about. If you'd been a congressman, you would know a lot about these kinds of things. If you'd been a lawyer, if you'd been a governor, but if you're coming out of nowhere, you know nothing about it completely. Secondly, you have a political problem. You don't really know how politics works in this town if you're in uniform. When you're in uniform, especially today, people are like, oh, Colonel, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, you're such a good person. I am. And maybe under their breath they're saying, yeah, it's good he's here. I mean, I wouldn't let my kid go into the service, but I'm really glad he's there. He looked like a fine young person. Uh, thanks for your service. And uh, so there's a little bit of that in this, but mostly people respect and admire the people in uniform. When you get out of the uniform or if you are working for a political party, automatically 30 to 35 percent of people don't like you, don't trust you. You're a Democrat or you're a Republican. And so you have that hostility. You have different rules of the road and how you say things and what you can say to the press and what the press believes in. Third problem is um, a legal problem. You don't know the law. Especially for John Kelly going into the job as, a, as the chief of staff, you don't know the law. I mean, you know, you've got to be careful what you say to people. You can be sued. You can be required to hire a private lawyer to protect yourself. And the final problem is an ethics problem. You have to be careful. In the military, there's no money, really, unless you're a thief. I mean, we found a few guys who tried to make money off contracting. But the ethics of money and politics, when you get into this, you've got to be really, really, really careful with things like conflict of interest, um, non-disclosure. Um, you, you, there are things you might learn that you can't take action on. And all across this country, in every state, every day, there are investigations that are finding dirt on legislators. Had, we just had the governor's nephew who was in the legislature in Arkansas forced out of the legislature and he's in jail now for this because people think, well, this guy's testifying in front of my committee. You mean the price of poultry is likely to go up? 
Buy me some of that Tyson stock right now. You know, and maybe you can do that in Congress. You can't do it in the military. Lyndon Johnson somehow got a hold of some TV stations, a lot of land in Texas, and that was then. Do it today, people say, I'm not so sure that's fair. They're watching those income statements. And then you have, you know, President Trump who's got foreign holdings. I, I understand what he's saying. He's got his own empire with his name on it. I mean, who's going to buy it? Mr. Jones is going to buy the Trump name and say, okay, now I'm Trump, okay, I got... It doesn't work. He knows he can't get rid of it. But on the other hand, he's got foreign business, and he's, and he's ambitious, and he likes it, and he likes doing deals with these people. So it's not much of a stretch to understand that foreign countries would say, uh, we got an appointment with the president. We're going to make sure we stay in the Trump Hotel, and uh, we're going to be able to say when we see him, Mr. President, we love your hotel. It's uh, got the most wonderful seafood in it. Thank you very much for this experience. And they're, they're going to think they're going to buy favoritism with him. Maybe they buy it, maybe they don't. But these are the kinds of ethical issues that confront military guys that they don't understand when they first get out of uniform. That's the hazard. But, you know, they got a lot of expertise and leadership and working with people. The country should use the talents of people. Nobody should be excluded from that. But when you're in uniform, no politics. So I will mention, as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, that John Kelly is in fact a graduate of this program. Um, and we could have a much longer conversation when this camera is not on. But um, let's do some questions. Let's do two or three at a time. Is that all right? Sure. We'll gather a However you want to do it. Great. You are raising your hand. So if you could just stand up, say your name, and if you're, you know, whatever your affiliation is. Uh, Dakota Carrier, I'm a full-time student here, and I worked on campaigns in the past. Um, I was wondering if you can think of anyone you've worked with in the military who has a known partisan identification and how they successfully mitigated that identity and, and worked around that. If I'd known somebody who had a partisan identification or didn't have one. Did have one. Did have how one. How they mitigated Actually, I, I didn't know anybody who had one. This is pre-social media. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know of anybody at the time. People didn't say it. I'll give you an example. So when I retired uh, and I was leaving um, command, there was a period of about 60 days when I came back from Europe before I got back to uniform, and Vice President Gore asked me to go with him to West Point to present the diplomas. I thought, well, this would be a high honor. I'll get to go up there and help him present. So he gave the speech, and I stood with him right beside him on the stage, and and shook hands and uh, as the cadets came through and it was a thrill. I was in uniform and it's a thrill to sort of be there and, and do that. It's a real honor for me and somebody said afterwards, well, you know, uh, Vice President Gore, you're on a short list to be Secretary of Defense. I thought, oh, really? Now maybe, you know, people say that because that's like, you know, like saying, uh, Maggie, you're a really great student. I know you're going to be, you know, terrific when you get out there in the consulting That's business. Awesome. I mean, it's what you say, you make people feel good. It, 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 they, it doesn't Gee, mean thanks. anything. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's no commitment, doesn't mean okay? Anything. It's yeah. just like a compliment, okay? But um, what I found later is Vice President Gore called me, and then he asked me to endorse him. So I called my former boss, General Charlie Koshfile. I said, uh, sir, uh, Vice President Charlie had retired three years earlier. I said, sir, our vice president asked me to endorse him. What do you think? He said, Wes, he said, there will be no endorsements. He said, were we to endorse Vice President Gore, there would, it would be 80 to 2 against us. That is to say, most of the generals would have, you know, yeah. endorsed a Republican. And so uh, we didn't do the endorsement. But he asked. So I didn't know, you know, whether Shawley was, I never knew whether Shawley was a Democrat or a Republican. And I wasn't anything. I was looking for an excuse not to endorse, and you know, he told me don't do it. If there are any women that have questions, this would be a great time. Okay. Sir Joshua Wilson, uh, current full-time student, active duty army officer, uh, army captain. Uh, question: You successfully coordinated and led NATO forces, as you said, during the Kosovo conflicts in Europe, uh, even amidst an aggressive Russian presence in that area that you had to mitigate friendship and possible adversary. Uh, what are your advices, what's your advice and key factors at this point in time to help coordinate and maintain that NATO uh, alliance? Well, the alliance is under heavy assault. During the Kosovo campaign, um, we knew that there were, uh, that the Russians would be opposed to this. 
Um, when I was uh, J-5, we uh, negotiated the Dayton Peace Agreement, and Secretary Perry and General Jell, and who was my predecessor as NATO commander in Europe, uh, worked out a way for the Russians to participate. They already had a battalion or brigade in Bosnia, so we brought them under U.S. command and control, essentially, and they signed up to it. But they soon started withdrawing troops. They just wanted to be there to sort of see what was going on and to try to have their say. And when it looked like we might have to use force against Milosevic, they began to throw obstacles in, like false intelligence and things like this. They brought me an intelligence document that showed that all of the Albanian rebels were actually just Chechens and terrorists. And it was, you know, so hokey that I laughed. And, and, and I had a Russian deputy and when he reported to Moscow that the Sakur didn't accept it, I guess they held him accountable and they brought him back to Moscow and they fired him basically, put him under house arrest. And so that ended... That sounds a little bit more than firing. Yeah, so that ended... <laughs> you see, what, what it was is, at the end of the Cold War, we never actually... The only thing that happened is you changed who was sitting in the seats at the top in behind the Iron Curtain. We didn't lustrate, they call it lustration. That's when you go through the intelligence agencies and you clean out the people who work for the other side. We never did that. Not in Poland, not in Hungary, certainly not in Russia. And then the people in Russia, they're all educated at Frunze Military Academy. They see the world as a chessboard. And when I was in Moscow in 98 talking to the Russian chief of defense, he said, he said, you're taking our countries in Eastern Europe and you want to sell them weapons, but these are our countries. I said, no, no, I mean, they're not. They're, they're independent countries. If your weapons are better than ours, you sell them. I mean, we're not trying to sell weapons there. That's not the point of this. He says, and, he said, you're going to take our minerals and make us poor. It's like, what are we, 16th century mercantilism here? <laughs> but, you know, that's their education. And so, uh, that never changed. So it's just, now you've got that education that has been uh, intensified because they saw what we did in Kosovo. They don't like it. Then they saw Libya. They liked that even less. And so, uh, and Putin realized he's going to have to, he wanted to regain the Soviet Union, basically. And what he tried to do was create this Eurasian Economic Union. They would have given him the Soviet Union, basically. If you control the border guards, the customs, the airspace, the electric power, uh, you've got the country. I mean, you can turn off their electricity anytime they, they don't do what you, and you don't even have to stand for election. That was the beauty of it. It was a great scheme, and <laughs> the stupid Europeans with their association agreement with the Ukrainians, they didn't even know what they were doing. They, they stuck their, their broomstick right in the spokes of Putin's bicycle. Yeah, he's mad, and he still wants that Eurasian Union back. And they disrupted it. They didn't even understand what they were doing. And so uh, he's gotten increasingly uh, affected. And, uh, and, and so now we have a Russia which, has, which is basically working a reverse containment policy on us. You know, um, you all studied uh, George Kennan and containment all that stuff. And um, we always believed that, you know, the Soviet Empire would collapse internally because it wasn't. And, and, and Nobody knew when, but then it did. And, but we never took advantage of it. We never went in there like we did with post-war Germany and Japan and said, okay, you guys got to change. I mean, you know, instead we just sort of turned our backs on them, threw them a few economists from the Chicago school and said, hey, hey, uh, uh, privatize those big industries and uh, don't have a lot of taxes and uh, good luck. And uh, by the way, be sure you vote. And, uh, and so it, it wasn't a transformation and now Putin's got it. So Putin wants the security of the Soviet space back, but he also wants to diminish the United States' influence. Both Putin and Xi Jinping believe that U.S. democratic values are the most potent force in the world. They're like an infection. They're like smallpox, and you can't stop it. You bring young people to places like Georgetown. Can I ask how many of you all are from outside the country? Wow. Gee, okay, great. I'm even more impressed. So you bring young people here from to Georgetown and they say, well, I can go down on M Street and, uh, you know, anytime and I can say whatever I want in those bars down there, they're a lot of fun. And <laughs> at 1789, it's great. And, I mean, I can do whatever I want. Nobody stops me. 
There's nobody going to go to my parents and say, your daughter, she will not be received well if she continues to associate with who she's associating with. And yet, that's the basic mechanism for social control over half the world's population. So people come here and they say, well, look at this, it's pretty nice, and uh, Americans have done pretty well. Why can't we do this in our country? That's why Xi Jinping says, Communist Party Directive Number 9, the greatest threat to China is the Western democratic values. The idea that people are sovereign, that you can make a choice by a vote, how could China be governed like that? You know, there's too many valleys, the emperor's too far away, he must have control. And so this is what is happening both in, with Russia and China right now. And um, the best way to control the infection is to isolate the infection. Five Caribbean nations have signed on to China's Belt and Road policy. And um, when the U.S. Uh, cuts off oil from Venezuela, countries like, little countries like Curaçao, anybody ever been to Curaçao? Beautiful little Caribbean place. Uh, 25% of the government revenue comes from a 330,000 barrel a day oil refinery that uses Venezuelan sour heavy oil and <laughs> sells it to the United States in diesel and gasoline efforts refined. Well, guess what? Now there's no food stock. So Curacao's going to go bankrupt. And guess who's offered to come in and operate the refinery for Curacao? Iran. Iran. Now, wouldn't that be sweet? So you've got Russia, China, uh, you've got Cuba, you've got Venezuela, you've got Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, and now you have the Caribbean there. It's a reverse containment policy. And at the same time, we have a national security apparatus that's so hard, so brittle, that when you force people like Erdogan say, choose, you keep that Russian system, you're not getting the F-35s, you make the choice. Okay, well, that's like telling, I don't, know if, I don't know if you all are married or not, but if you are, you never give that kind of a discussion to your spouse. <laughs> it's like, you're either going to dinner and we're seeing a movie, or else, you choose. I mean, it's like, get the hell out. I mean, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't do, you don't treat people that way, and especially valued allies. You have to work. You have to have some flexibility in diplomacy. It's not black or white. And when you think you're putting the pressure on that way, look, what the United States has done, Mike, run over No, my I'm going to ask you about Venezuela. Okay. We've got a few minutes. So I'm, we're going to get there. So, what the United States has done over the last 20 years is use its stock of capital. If you think about it in business terms, any of you all take any business courses or just politics? I would love for someone to raise their hand right now. Okay, look, I'm an investment okay. banker. I'm an investment banker, okay? You only got so much capital in a company. And so when a new CEO comes in and he says, hey, I've got a great company here, I'm going to take out a loan and I'm going to give it to the shareholders, and they're going to really like those dividends, and then I'm going to give them some stock buybacks with my loan. That's basically what the United States did. But it's not just Donald Trump. It's previous presidents who've done this for the last, really since the end of the Cold War. We've drawn on the power of the U.S. economy. We use sanctions. We use our economic leverage. We tell people, if you don't do what we say, you're going to get your bank accounts cut off through SWIFT, and we've got your money. Well, okay, that's good for five years, 10 years, 20 years, but at some point somebody else said, comes along and says, you know what, these Americans are so damn stubborn. I mean, can't we, can't we buy oil with renminbis? And the answer is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the Chinese are doing. They're buying Saudi oil with renminbis. Xi Jinping wants a convertible currency. So for every bit of pressure you apply this way, it squeezes out somewhere, somewhere else. And this is what... I worry about with the United States. We need to replenish our capital stock, not draw down on it, not use it up. We used up our military 18 years in Afghanistan. When I talk to the colonels, and I apologize to those who fought there in Afghanistan and Iraq, they don't say, we won! No. When I talk to Kosovo Albanians, they say that about Kosovo. But the people who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq, they're not saying that. The troops did great. Our soldiers, Marines, airmen, they're fantastic. However, the policies weren't good, and we didn't have the right direction from the top, 
and maybe we shouldn't have even been there in Iraq to start with because there was no reason to start a war like that, in my view. That's why I ran for president in the first place, because I was against that war. But we've drawn down the military, we've drawn down the economy, we've got high debt, we're putting a lot of pressure on our allies. We're playing into the hands of Russia and China with their, with their containment strategy. We're encouraging that. When you hammer your allies and think that NATO's about money, it isn't. NATO's always been about the glove around the American hand. And when you withdraw the hand, the glove does nothing. That's why we failed in Syria, we the West. That's why all those refugees came into Europe, because President Obama had his hand in the glove, and he's like, hey, don't do stupid stuff. What are we going to do? And he asked the military, what are we going to do after we take out their air defense and stuff like that? And the military's like, uh -huh. you know, I don't want that. But you know, my problem as a military guy, and the reason I am the way I am, is because I, I did Vietnam. I'd seen civic action. And I was with Holbrook. And I had done diplomacy and seen it. So, like I say, I was neither fish nor fowl. I'm not a good Democrat. I'm not a Republican. And I'm not, you know, the others. Because the world doesn't break it to camps. The world is a complex, difficult place. And this country has got to find a strategy to deal with the reverse containment, to replenish its capital stock, to understand how it's going to respond to a China. This is not a new Cold War. China is just asserting what's normal in human history. They've always been, China's always been the center of human civilization. <laughs> this is just a normal course of things. China invented everything first until, like, they closed off the ports and 1420-something was the change in dynasty, and it opened up an opportunity for the Europeans to come and take over Asia. So we've got major strategic challenge. Now you want to talk Venezuela? I mean, I do want to ask you about Venezuela, but other questions? Let's do both. One, two. Thank you, General. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong. And, uh, I think What's your name? Uh, my, my name is Lu, uh, first year graduate student, SSB. Um, I just, uh, my assumption is like institutional do uh, feel frame people's minds, right? And I, when I was in academia and investment bank and now uh, security uh, studies, I feel like that institution does, my mindset, mindset get tunneled uh, and the weight of institutions. And you transfer from military and also military uh, requires a long trajectory of career and from a military to civil, uh, civilian life and investment bank. How do you feel that transi transitions, and also I, uh, how to see the trees and forest at the same time? I don't in way you, uh, when you get inside the within the industry, but not losing the uh, vision, a broader vision. How to do that? Mitigate that? Uh, it's really hard to go. Hold on, from, let's do his at the same Okay, time. we're going to do more than one question. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Hello, John. This is Steve McFarland, second year SSP student, uh, former Foreign Service officer. And my question is, you had mentioned uh, General MacArthur's uh, uh, remarks to the West Point class about uh, trying to put that sort of divide between uh, military leaders and political leaders. Uh, you yourself uh, led uh, successfully uh, a war in a highly charged political context. Um, what can you, what insights do you have as to arguably what went wrong in Iraq and Afghanistan at that level, where, where the senior uh, military officers are running up against the political leadership? And you know, you know, based on that, what should we, uh, you know, what should the United States be doing to try to make things better? Okay, now that, that, that's a really great question, a tough question. I'm going to answer this one first, okay? Sure. Transitioning. But when you transition, you have to throw yourself into what your new profession is. You have to give it a 100% effort. But you don't want to lose friends and relations from your previous existence. And this is a tough balancing act. So um, the only advice I can give you is that the older you are when you start, the more difficult it is because of ego. Especially if you've been successful, if you've been a failure in a in a profession and you get out of it, 
I met a young woman who um, had several years in naval aviation, and she was a naval flight officer, but she always got air sick, and she finally, you know, admitted it, <laughs> and she questions. got out of naval aviation. And I'm sure, you know, for her starting a new profession, it's like, don't ask me about naval aviation. <clears throat> I succeeded in it, but enough was enough, and, you know, I'm now in something else. But for most of us who make these transitions after your early first start, if you've been in the service more than four years, if you've had your first tour in an embassy, and you say, okay, that's it, but it's not for me, fine, no problem. But when you make the transition later, you always have a feeling like you're, you, you, you were so successful in your previous experience, and then and now you're going into something and the cards are stacked against you, and these people, you know, they went to Harvard Business School, and uh, all you did was study policy at Georgetown, and, uh, and, and what do they know that you don't know, and who do they know that you don't know, and how do you catch up? And uh, So you, you have these feelings that are inside of you that you must deal with, and the way you deal with them is hard work and being nice to people and building relationships and, and, and just controlling your fears and, and your ego. So you try not to talk about how successful you were in the previous life, you know, I did more carrier landings than any other, you know, stop that, you know, that's not relevant now. And, but then at the same time, you have to say to yourself, you're willing to learn and uh, you're going to make some mistakes and you can't get down on yourself for doing that. And then you have to honestly ask whether you have an aptitude for it. So you always have to, look, all, life is always about half ways. Nobody's perfect. Nobody gets everything right. Everybody has had challenges and failures and life is long. It's not smooth and easy. When I was 14 years old, my mother gave me a Reader's Digest article that talked about the most wonderful cadet who'd ever been through the military academy. I had no intention of going to West Point, but I was interested in going into the Navy, and she said, look at this young man. His name was Peter Dawkins. Peter Dawkins came from Michigan, and he was an athlete. You and have an he incredible was memory. My six, God. <laughs> six foot three, blonde haired, blue eyes, graduated from, um, from high school in 1955, went right to West Point. He was a three-sport letterman at West Point. He was also smart, and he stood at the top of the class, like fourth or fifth in the class academically. And he was popular. He was the president of the class. And he was trustworthy, so he was the chairman of the honor committee. And it turned out he was good enough in football that he was a halfback, and he won the Heisman Trophy. And then they liked him so much, he won a Rhodes Scholarship. And so he was the first captain, president of the student body, chairman of the honor committee, Three sport letterman, Rhodes Scholar, Heisman Trophy winner. My mother showed me this. It's like, and, and, and a really handsome, impressive guy, you know, really, you know, strong jaw and everything. Like, God, this is, this is so amazing. And yet, for Pete, and I've kept up with him off and on through most of my life, he's an admirable man, but, you know, everything didn't just roll over for him. Everybody said, oh, here comes Pete Dawkins, get out of the way. I mean, there are bumps and grinds along the road in every person's life, no matter how you think you're starting. So the thing about life is to be resilient. Keep it in balance. Give it 100% in your profession. Give it 100% in your family. Keep your integrity. This is probably the most important thing. Integrity is like a block of ice. When you're a young person and you're in college or you're coming out of a program like this, you have a 100% square solid block of ice. Everybody said, well, they're honest, trustworthy, not going to do anything wrong. But as you go through life, the compromises will present themselves to you. And the block of ice starts to melt. And the thing about it is, you can't refreeze it. You start with the highest standard. And then, when you make the compromises, when you cut the corners, I'm not saying, you can't say to the hostess at the carrot casserole was really the best you'd ever tasted. That's not what I'm talking about. But when you start making the compromises, when you pick yourself in business over another worthy competitor and, 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 and cut them down in private and, and, and play those kinds of bureaucratic games, or even worse, when you actually cheat or just a little bit or cut corners on your income tax or don't report stuff, and. It melts. 
And at the end, when you're looking back on your life, you have to confront your integrity, your standards, your values. And that's really kind of the most important thing that there is. So be careful with that. Okay, now on Iraq. First of all, the war was a political fabrication. So no matter what the military said, it wasn't going to matter. Now why do I say this? Because right after 9-11, there was a meeting at Camp David in which the Under Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz said, Oh, Mr. S Mr. President, this is a time to go after Saddam Hussein. You know, we've been looking for a reason to go get him. We'll clean him out now. He must have been involved with this. I got a call the day of 9-11 from the Israelis saying, you're on television. You better say this was done by with state sponsorship. Saddam did this. I'm like, okay, show me the evidence. I'll say it. But there was no evidence. Five days after 9-11, they were at Camp David. And on the way out, President Bush says to Hugh Shelton, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, says, yeah, yeah. in the meeting, Bush said to Wolfowitz, nah, nah, we've got we to deal with, with, with Osama. But on the way out, he shakes Hugh's hand and said, don't worry, we're going to get that guy. We're going to get him. So three weeks after that, after 9-11, I'm in the Pentagon, just checking sources, you know, I mean, I didn't have a black stripe on my uniform and, and, and I, you know, there was no public affairs officer say, sir, be careful what you say. It's like, I don't, and I didn't get a daily intelligence brief. And I'm supposed to be commenting every day on this. So I went to see Secretary Rumsfeld, who I'd worked for before, and Paul Wolfowitz, who I know. And on the way out, a guy from the Joint Staff pulled me aside and he said, sir, you know, you need to come in and see me. I said, okay, but you're busy. He said, no, 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 let me tell you, we're going to invade Iraq. I said, but why? Why? Did, did we find the connection with 9-11? He said, no, no. He said, honestly, I don't know why. He said, maybe because we're not really that good against fighting terrorists, but we're really good at taking down governments. <laughs> okay? That's where it started. And there was a grand scheme that you could go from Iraq and maybe, hey, why don't we get rid of Syria in the process? That guy, Bashar Assad, he's like he connected with the, with the commies. Like, get rid of him, and then we can go get Gaddafi. And so there was a plan that was floated in the Pentagon, not a real plan, but like a concept proposal. It's like, let's take five years, let's clean out all these old states, finish off Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. We never, look, Lebanon should be Christian, okay? Instead, you've got all these crazy people, you got the French there, they were always wusses anyway. This is, you know, this is the American perception of this. And, uh, you know, they never stood, we're going to take Lebanon, we're going to fix, and then you got Gaddafi, no one ever, like, he threw us out of Wheelis Air Force Base, and then, and then we got this guy in Somalia, and then in Sudan, and, and then we're going to finish off Iran. Yeah. I mean, this was like the tough guy talk in the Pentagon, you know, like, we got the president on our side, we got the power, you know, and I'm, this is why I ran, this is what I ran against, because I knew it was hokey, it was dangerous. We don't have the army, the values, the country, the constitution, or any reason to go to war against these countries. And you guys in uniform, you were like me in Vietnam. President says, suit up, get out there, put your game face on, and you do it. And you trust the chain of command. It was bad at the start. And then it was made worse because Secretary Rumsfeld had this idea, he was a Navy fighter pilot. And he knew the Army from the post-Vietnam period because he'd been Secretary of Defense during the Ford administration, 75, 76, and he knew the Army's like big and slow and bloated and, oh, Mr. Secretary, give us a couple of more days and we'll come back to you with an answer on that. We can't answer right now. Rumsfeld's like, he's the sharpest kid in the class, eh? General, what's your idea? Sir? Oh, sir, uh, you know, I, I'll have to consult my staff. It's like, what the hell? What kind of a general are you? You don't know anything. And so Rumsfeld was, he was toxic to the army culture. And so the plan of 500,000 people was whittled down to 95,000 people. And then we didn't get the 4th Infantry Division in through Turkey. And, you know, Barry McCaffrey was on television. I'm on television. saying, we don't have enough troops. Oh, the troops look great. They're doing great. But you can't occupy a country. I talked to a guy who commanded 369 Armor the other day. And uh, he told me he had, he had like, 90,000 people, and he had 500 soldiers, and they said, you're in charge. 
you maintain order here. And by the way, you have permission to shoot anyone who's a looter. It's like, we're not going to go start shooting a bunch of civilians because they're breaking into abandoned buildings? Are you crazy? We can't speak the language. We don't have interpreters. It was a terrible plan and so bad that we didn't even take the surrender. You know, after MacArthur dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, there was a surrender document that was signed. And he went to see the emperor and he got legitimacy. Who was going to give the United States legitimacy in Iraq? Uh, well, the Iraqi military. I mean, they're like military anywhere. They tell me where to fight, I'll fight. You know, my job's to fight and win. My job's not to decide. All we had to do was take the head off the Iraqi military, the guys who had been compromised politically with Saddam Hussein, said, guys, get out there, come on out, take care of your country. You fought for this, it's your country, we're here to back you up. Instead, we ran them underground. It wouldn't have been a piece of cake anyway, and my friend Walt Slocum, who was there, says, oh, there was no Iraqi military, that's wrong. They were all lined up for 369 armor right there in Sadr City looking for their retirement. It's like, you promised us retirement, now we got nothing. We destroyed that country. So is there a lesson learned? Yeah, I mean, like thousands of them. But here's the most important lesson. When you're up at the top and they give you the four stars, it's your obligation to speak truth to power. And when you feel it's going wrong, it's your obligation to get off the ship. Not to say, sir, I disagree with everything you're saying, but okay. No, that's, that's the way a lieutenant does it. When you're a lieutenant and the colonel says, I want you on that hill and you hold that hill and you hold that hill until I come and tell you you can come off. I don't care what the losses are. The whole brigade's responsibility is centered on your hill. You got it, Captain? You say, yes, sir. And then you say, but I think there's a better way. I think if I moved off the hill, I could shoot, you know, on the hill. He says, Captain, get on that hill and hold it. And you say, yes, sir. You don't say, oh, sir, since you didn't accept my tactical advice, I'm resigning. You don't say that. <laughs> but as a, as, as a top military leader, you're expected to have the courage, the convictions, the knowledge to be able to deal with your political masters that way. They won't like it. That's your problem. You know? You've already had your time. You owe loyalty downward to the troops, not just upward to the boss. So that's, that to me is the principal lesson. And when you went back into and said, well, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and how did this exactly happen and why did it work out like this? You're into a whole complex interplay of personalities. And um, we could talk about that offline if you want. But the basic thing is you guys and gals who are in the service and connected. This is your time to sort of get your, get things lined up in order and put first things first and know what you're doing. Your job is not to make policy unless you're put in a policy position like I was as a, as a J-5. I was in a policy position. Your job is to do the job. But when you're the colonel, when I went over to see General Casey and General Avizade and I had to tell them, I said, you guys, I'm, I'm, they're like afraid to meet with me. And, and I said, you're not winning. He said, well, we're doing what we're told to do. Okay, you're doing what you were told to do. Uh, that's your choice. You're lost. And then we put Petraeus in and he got us an honorable, you know, withdrawal, basically. But we weren't winning and we're still not winning in that theater. So the closest we've come is Steve Townsend, actually, with using special forces and air power if you believe you can solve and beat terrorists by killing them. Maybe you have to do that, but it doesn't seem to stop recruiting. ISIS is still there, so we've got to have a non-military, bigger than military, whole of government, whole of, whole of humanity solution on terrorism. Young people become terrorists because they don't know what they're going to do with their lives. You've got to bring them onto your side. The same satisfaction you get from wearing a uniform and serving your country is what they're looking for. They can't find it. They had to adopt a cause. Yes, it's going to cause a lot of people grief, but you know, how did you feel? I talked to a guy who was behind a Bradley 25 millimeter from the Arkansas National Guard the first time in 2005, and he fired that 25 millimeter and he hit some people and he didn't like it. He said, I saw, I was looking through the site and I'm hitting people and I, uh, this is a really bad feeling. So, 
The terrorists probably have the same feeling. You don't know that. You don't know. But you know this, that we all start out as human beings. We have to find a way to bring the world together and give people meanings and significance in their lives. That's the real key. Did I answer it? And I, I'd, I'd and say I told yes. That, didn't I? Well, we've got one. We have time for one more question, and okay. since I'm moderating, I'm taking it. Um, Venezuela. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to ask you what you think we're going to do. Okay, though I well, right now there's a coup underway. Yeah, so there's a coup. Um, that's ours. Yes. If it isn't, it should have been. <laughs> okay, so that's the answer. Well, it may not be the answer because it probably won't work. Okay, so then what? So, you know, you might live with it. Huh. You think it's worth living with? Why well, don't... I think there are certain things you can't fix in life. And you have to look beyond the, the, the first problem. To the next set of issues and work those issues. So I think, you know, if you can't fix Venezuela, you've got to stabilize the Caribbean. You've got to look at Central America. You've got to make sure Colombia and Peru are okay. You've got to work more closely with, with Brazil. I wouldn't mind seeing Brazil a member of NATO. I mean, you could say it's a South Atlantic extension of NATO. But, but uh, you know, people made fun of it. I don't think there's anything to make fun of. Brazil is a great country, and uh, we'd love to have them as a partner. They have to ascribe to democratic values. But um, so you have to look beyond it. You may not be able to fix Venezuela. I don't think you can. If the coup doesn't work and there's people starving, then the next thing you, I guess you do is you go to the OAS, you organize an intervention force that would establish refugee camps and holding areas on the borders of Venezuela and you would use those to create a Venezuelan political opposition and in the camps there would be the development of a shadow army and the shadow army would not be trained in the camps because that would bring an attack but you would send them to places that were friendly like Panama or Honduras and you would stage them there and then they would come back in and like a reprise of the Bay of Pigs and uh, then the people in the camps would swarm out and millions of people would come out. Could you do that? Sure. But can you do it against Russian air defense? Right. Can you do it against Chinese money? Can you do it against 10 million Venezuelans who are paid off by the government and thugs? And what are you going to do when you do it? If it's not Venezuela, it's not us. We, we're, we're not an occupying power. That's not what we do. What we do is in, we give people an infection the democracy infection. So here's your infection, Shh. now go make it work. And of course it never works quite as well. And maybe Australia did, they only had the Aborigines. We had the American Indians that owned the land and over a period of centuries we took over the land from the American Indians in a horrible set of events. We think we created everything. We didn't. We were lucky. We had room to expand and we there was a lot of injustice and a lot of immorality and illegality in what we did to become who we are. And then we expect everybody else to be perfect. So they're not going to be perfect. But one thing we know, we can't handle Venezuela by putting an American force in and keeping it there. It has to be Venezuela. So, you know, maybe it'll work. I hope the coup works. I hope we get a, a better outcome, but going up some against some entrenched forces. I've got a lot more questions about Venezuela. You all have been a great there. audience. There's a lot of people nodding, and um, I've got a few minutes to hang around if anybody wants to continue the discussion. And I just want to say, look, um, it's a very, it's a, um, a very scary thing for you to take every word that I speak because you're not at the same place in your lives, and you haven't seen the same things. And uh, this is, I'll be 75 this year. So I came home from Vietnam on a stretcher. I've been through a lot. And um, your lives are yet to be lived out. You have to find your own way forward. So I don't want to frighten you. My odds of making four stars, they were stacked against me from the beginning. And my friend Pete Dawkins, he didn't make four stars. And, uh, and he's had a perfectly happy, wonderful life. I just happen to be one of those people. So you can't measure yourself against someone else. You measure yourself against yourself. 
And remember, the most important thing is that block of ice called integrity. You keep that block of ice as whole and complete as you can. And that's the record of your life. Not how many stars, not how much money, not how many houses, just about who you are as a person. Thank you.